Thank you for joining us for this week's message at Crosswind Church. In this series, Dear Brothers, Sincerely Joseph, Jeremy will be guiding us through the book of Genesis, revealing a lesson on forgiveness. If you have any questions about this message or about Crosswind Church, please visit us at www.crosswindchurch.net or you can email us at info at crosswindchurch.net. So um, today we get to begin a brand new series, and I want to talk to you just a little bit about it before we dive into uh, our Bible text for today. Um, we're going to kind of handle this series just a little bit differently than we have other series. If you're new to Crosswind, let me kind of tell you what I mean by series. Um, kind of what we do as a staff and as a group of elders as we gather together, we pray about uh, what is it we feel like God wants Crosswind to hear. And so we pick some topics that God lays on our heart, and then we talk about that topic until we're done, and then we pick a new topic, and that's kind of how we do it. And uh, most of the time what we do when we do a sermon in a series is we spend a little bit of time talking about some practical things you can do to kind of put that into play in your life every week. We kind of handle that. Um, this series is four weeks long, and we're thinking of this series as one big giant sermon. Uh, if that makes sense. And so today, uh, we're going to kind of do some intro stuff, and there will be some application stuff, but it's going to be kind of light. Next week, there's going to be a little bit more, and by the time we get to the fourth week, it's going to be real heavy on now here's what we do uh, with it. And one of the reasons we wanted to do that is because of kind of the subject matter, we're going to talk about that. So here's what I need you to do. If you um, get to, first of all, come back next week. That's what I want you to do. I don't want you to miss a week in the next four weeks. <clears throat> If by chance you do, however, uh, Casey Parker, who is our administrative assistant here, uh, is great about getting video and audio up on the web. You can go to crosswindchurch.net under resources and watch video on our YouTube channel. That you can download the podcast. You can uh, subscribe via iTunes, get the, you know to the podcast, all of that, uh, and catch up because we want everybody to be a part of, of, of what we're going to be talking about. And if you miss a week, uh, you may miss part of the story, and I don't want you to miss part of the story, okay? Good? Good. Okay. Um, that having been said, um, I love getting to talk to kids um, because they're just so like like raw and just like they're not afraid to say what's on their mind. And one of my favorite things to, to ask a child is, what do you want to be when you grow up? Because what you do when you ask that question is you get kind of this conglomerate of what is influencing them at the moment, something that they see is really, really cool. I was asking Jody on the way home from Nashville last night, I said, Jody, what is it you wanted to be when you grew up? And she says, well, I was about five, I wanted to work at McDonald's. Like, that was what I wanted to do. I think everybody, like, you know, you want, man, like, that's where they make happy meals. Like, it's a happy place to work. And so, um, if you were to ask me at that point in time, you know, at various times in my life, uh, growing up, what it is I wanted to be when I grew up, you would have heard what was influencing me. You would have heard kind of what I was watching. So, um, in mid-80s, uh, when I was like, seven or eight years old, um, I saw a movie, uh, and I don't know if it was good parenting or bad parenting that my parents let me watch the movie. It's on them, uh, but I saw I saw Top Gun, the movie. I saw it like five times in the theater. Uh, I used to be able to quote the entire movie. I don't know if that's good parenting or bad parenting. It just is. Anyway, regardless of that, um, so at, at, from about third grade until about fourth or fifth grade, I wanted to be uh, a Navy fighter pilot. That's what I wanted to do, and, I, and I'm telling you, I've I, I went headlong into it. I had the jacket with the patches on it. I had cute little kid-sized aviator glasses. Um, I, I, you know, I spiked my hair up real short. I bought a hat and had it made. It said Top Gun across the front of it. Like, that was why I was going to be a Navy fighter pilot. And then, uh, you know, somebody kind of let me know, Jeremy, you know, you have to be like, there's like certain requirements they have for you being in a jet. Like, it'd be a certain height. And I figured that was out. And, and you know, and I've got these medical conditions and, they may not even put let you in the Navy with that. And so I thought, well, that, that dream, I guess, is going to have to die. And, and so uh, a little bit after that, I saw another movie, and it was a, like a police movie. And so I wanted to be a detective. Like I wanted, I wanted to be a detective, like with the badge. And I wanted to say stuff like, nothing but the facts, ma'am. You know? And I wanted to go to like, to like, uh, you know, like crime scenes and, and walk under the yellow tape. And, and I wanted to interview people and put all the pieces together and solve all the trouble. I loved it so much. Let me tell you what I did. And this is a little bit embarrassing. Um, but it's true. <clears throat> At my church, I created a detective agency for my church. I did. And there were three of us guys that were a part of it. Um, Jonathan Clark, who's the BCM director at Murray State University. Michael Finch, who still goes to that church. Like, I'm telling you, we were just a detective agency. And we had, like, administrative assistants. We didn't call them that then. We had secretaries. And, um, and, uh, and we, like, were going around the church going, so, like, you got anything we can investigate? Like, that was us. We just had signs up by the church. Like, that was what we did. We were these detectives. And then that dream kind of fizzled out. But in middle school, 
middle school, I had this dream that was different than all the others. In middle school, something kind of clicked in me, and I went, you know what, I think this is, this is, this is what I want to be when I grow up. See, in middle school, I had another one of these pesky infections that I get from time to time. And it was kind of tricky. It was in a spot that's not real easy to get to. And so they had to admit me to the hospital at Vanderbilt. I was there for about a week. And, and while I was there, the, the doctors and nurses, because of the type of infection, they had to run all kinds of tests and probes and poke me and prod me and all that kind of stuff. And the nurses and doctors would come in. And I started noticing this, this pattern in middle school. They would come in and they would say, uh, now, Jeremy, what, what, what's about to happen? It's going to burn just a little bit. Or, hey, this is going to sting just a little bit. Or, or hey, this, this might hurt just a little bit. And I got to thinking about that. And, and here's the question that went in my little middle school mind. If you have middle schoolers, maybe you'll get it. Here's what I asked. How do you know? Right? How do you know it's going to burn a little bit? How do you know it's going to hurt just a little bit? And so I started asking a question of doctors and nurses in middle school that I still ask today. And here's the question that I asked. Hey, have you ever had this done to you? That's what I always ask. Hey, if you're doing anything other than like put an IV in me, if you're shoving a tube in my arm or some kind of culture or, or whatever, I, the question I always ask is, hey, has this ever been done to you? And here's the interesting thing. Almost always, almost always, they would look at me and they would kind of get a, a, a defeated look on their face and they would go, no. No, I haven't. Here's what I thought. I thought, you know what? I've got, to, I've got to go into medicine. I've got to go into medicine. Here's why. Like, like can you imagine, as a, as a pediatrician, like being able to go to the bedside of a child who's scared, who doesn't know what, what's going to happen next, and look at him and go, here's the thing, watch, watch. What I'm getting ready to do is going to be crummy, and it's going to hurt, and it's not going to be good. But, 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 I've had it done to me. And I know, I know what it's going to feel like, and I know... Listen, and I've come through the other side of it. And look, I'm, I'm, I'm standing right here. It's going to be fine. I thought, man, that would have changed my childhood to have somebody do that. And so I thought, well, that's, that's kind of what I, I want to do. The thing is, I'm standing here in front of you, not in a white coat as an MD. And so you know somewhere along the line that, that plan got changed just a little bit. Somewhere along the line, and you guys know the story. It's another story from another day. Somewhere along the line, God redirected my path and the dream of being a medical doctor, influencing children and adults in that way, it just went away. See, I, I don't know your stories. I say that all the time. I don't, I don't know all of you, and I don't know all of your stories, but here's what I know about your story. At some point along the time in your life, at some point in your life, you've experienced dreams that were broken. You've experienced dreams and, and grand visions for your life that just didn't quite turn out the way that you wanted it to be. Come on. Maybe it was vocationally, like I just talked about. Maybe you thought that you'd be a successful business owner by the, this age in your life, and you'd have all kinds of money banked up and your retirement taken care of, and you'd be getting ready to retire in a couple of years. Maybe that's what you thought. You'd have the house and the cars and the boat in the driveway, and, 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 and you'd have the vacation home at the beach or wherever else, and you thought, that's what I'm going to have. And, and, and you look around, and it's just not there. And it's discouraging. It's frustrating to know these were the dreams that I had and now, and now those dreams aren't there. Maybe it was with, with regard to your marriage. And you, you thought that once I get married, then, then, then things will change. Once I get married, that addiction will go away. Once I get married, then, then, then I won't have to deal with this anymore. This is what my wife is going to be like and this is what my husband is going to be like. And then you get married and you realize you married another human being. And it's just not the way that you envisioned it to be. Maybe it's even bigger than that. Maybe you look down the road and you went, you know what, I see myself growing old with this person, sitting on the front porch, rocking chairs, you know, with coffee in our hand, watching the sun rise or the sunset, depending on whether you're a morning or a night person, right? And that's what you thought, and then that marriage just didn't work out. And the second marriage just didn't work out. Sometimes the third marriage just doesn't work out. And, and, and you are left single, not when you thought you'd be single. You know what it's like to have that, that, imp, that just, ugh, why didn't it happen the way that I thought it would happen? Maybe it's with your children. Maybe you thought you would have them, and for some reason you can't. Maybe it's you thought they would be the valedictorian or the, the, the star athlete or both or whatever else, and, and it turns out that, that, that they're not what you dreamed for whatever reason it was. See, we could talk all day long, and I could give example after example after example. If we were to dig down deep, we all know what it's like to have dreams 
and then to not have them come to fruition, don't we? Now, here's the thing. Sometimes it's because you made some bad decisions. Let's be honest, right? I mean, the common denominator in all of your failed dreams is you. I hate that. Say that, but it's true about mine too. Listen, maybe, maybe it's decisions you made. Maybe you partied a little too much in high school and college when you should have been studying. Right? Maybe you, maybe you went and racked up a bunch of debt when you should have been saving. Whatever it is, maybe you made those decisions. Maybe you didn't make those decisions. Maybe those decisions were made for you. Maybe for you, your dreams kind of imploded when you went to the doctor and he said it's cancer. Maybe it happened to you when someone that was close to you that you love died. Maybe it went out of the blue. Just out of the blue. Your husband walks up to you. Your wife walks up to you. And they say, I don't want to be married to you anymore. And you didn't make that decision, but somebody made it for you. And in that process of those decisions, you saw things just implode. It's not the way that you wanted it to be. It's not the way that you intended it to be. We all know what that feels like. To be honest with you, that's, that's a little bit about what this series is about. <laughs> no, it's not, it's not a series where we teach you, you know, some kind of self-help techniques and how to rebuild your dreams, although that may happen because of it. It's not one of those series that causes us to look back in the past and assign blame and lay blame and, and, all, uh, and deal with the mistakes that maybe that we made, although that may happen in the process. Here's what this series is about. This series isn't about who's to blame. There's plenty of blame to go around. This series isn't about how your dreams didn't turn out the way they, that, you did, that you wanted them to. That, that's, not, that's not what this series is about. This series is about is what happens now. This series is about is now that you find yourself here, what do you do? How do you respond? How do you move forward when things didn't happen the way that you wanted them to happen? And today we get to, to, to dive into a story of a man in Scripture. In fact, his story takes up uh, so much of the book of Genesis. About 13 or 14 chapters or so in the book of Genesis are devoted just to the story of a man named Joseph. Now, if you've been around church for a while, you may know who Joseph is. If you're a newcomer, let me see if I can, can, can bring you up to speed. You see, years before Joseph was born, there was a man named Abram. Later, his name would turn to Abraham. You may have heard Abraham. The, the song is, Father Abraham had many sons. Anyway, if you went to VBS, you sung it, right? Here's what God told Abraham. God told Abraham, Abe, I'm picking you. You're going to be the man that from which the nation, a nation is formed. And it's not just going to be any nation. It's going to be my people. And I'm going to be their God. And I know, Abraham, that you're old. But God is going to, I'm going to do this thing in you. And so Abraham believes God. And he has a son named Isaac. And Isaac is given the same promise that Abraham was given. And Isaac had a son named Jacob. And later on, Jacob is going to have this wrestling match with God. That's another story for another day. And his name is going to be changed to Israel. And Israel is going to have... 12 sons by four different mamas. Wrap your head around that. Right? Like, guys, come on. I can't even keep the one mama and two babies I have happy. I can't imagine 12 sons, four mamas. That's crazy. That's why you should read your Bible. Okay, so... So he has 12 sons. And, 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 and these sons, watch, would become the 12 tribes of Israel. From them, the entire nation would be born. There were names like Levi and Judah and Benjamin. And 11th on the list was a man by the name of Joseph. And today, we're going to start looking at his story. And we're not going to be done for four weeks. So if at some point along the way I say something, you go, yeah, but... At some point along the way, you go, oh, but I kind of know the rest of it. Come back next week. We'll pick it up where we left off. But let's start reading in the book of Genesis. That's the very first writing in the Bible. We're going to be in chapter 37. And we're going to begin in verse 1. Jacob, a.k.a. Israel, remember you guys' name changed, lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. And this is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17. Let me ask you this question. Show of hands. How many of you have been 17? 
I just want you to keep that in mind as we're reading here, okay? Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending flocks with his brothers and sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. Those were two of the three. His mama, his mama was Rachel, and, uh, and she had already passed away at this point. And he brought their father a bad report about them. Now, guys, come on. Anybody that has a sibling, you understand what's going on. I'm just going to pause and mention this. We're going to keep reading. So Joseph is, is one of the youngest sons. He's number 11. He's got 10 older brothers, and they're all shepherding. And, and the boys out in the field are being boys. And they're doing stuff that they weren't supposed to do. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what that means. But it was enough for Joseph to be able to go back to his daddy and be a tattle tale. Now, if you have had a brother or a sister, you can say amen to this, right? You know what we're talking about. Because you know what it's like to have a brother or sister go, oh, you'll never believe what so-and-so did. I'm going to go tell daddy on you. And that's what Joseph did. Now, let me ask you this question. When your brother or sister tattled on you, did you like it or was that okay with you? Of course you didn't like it. That was horrible. No one would do that. Why would you rat on your brother, right? Okay, but that's what he does. He brings a bad report about them. Verse 3, here's another problem. Now, Israel, that, that's, that's a.k.a. Jacob. Remember the same person. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than his other sons because he had been born to him at his old age, and he made an ornate robe for him. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Now, again, I didn't have a sibling growing up. I don't know what it's like to have a brother or a sister, but I bet some of y'all do, okay? Now, here's the thing. If I were to go and to ask you, who was your parents' favorite child? Here's what I've learned over time the majority of you would say someone other than yourself, right? It was them, right? That it was my sister. It was my brother. They let them, I let, my dad and mama let them get away with everything, but they came down on me. There were times that my brother and sister would do things, and my parents would come and I would get punished because they did something, because somehow I was supposed to do something, whatever, right? You know what I'm talking about? Sometimes it's great when you have like multiple siblings, and you can look at, at, at one, and, and two of them like conspire against the other one. They're like, oh yeah, it was definitely him, right? He was. And every now and then you find that honest person who's like, yeah, it was me. I was the favorite sibling. That was, that was me. I, it was me. So, so here's the thing. So although you're not supposed to pick favorites with your kids, and although no one picks favorites with their kids, here's, here's what Jacob did. He picked a favorite. And I've heard stories of people where it was kind of ambiguous who the favorite might be or whatever. There was no ambiguity in the family of Jacob. The reason is because uh, Jacob made Joseph this technicolor dream coat. Right? You know what I'm talking about? This multicolored robe. And it signified to everybody, woo, 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 here's my favorite. And you know how it feels to be left out. You know how it feels to not be the favorite. You know how it feels to be the one that doesn't get invited to the party. It's not fun. It says the brothers had had it with Joseph. Now, is this Joseph's fault? Should they be really mad at Joseph? No. Not at this point. Because whose fault is it that, that Joseph is a favorite? It's dad's fault. But they're not going to be mad at dad. They're going to be mad at little brother. Because Joseph has this coat. Because Jacob loves him more because... Ultimately, he came from Jacob's favorite wife. Happened to be born when he was really old. Then, Joseph is going to take a bad situation. He's going to make it even worse. Look at verse 5. Joseph had a dream. Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We're binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheep arose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. And his brother said to him, Do you intend to reign over us, little brother? Are you sure? Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream. And he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time, the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. Now, time out real quick. It didn't go well, did it, when he told him the first dream? Now, what we're learning is Joseph has zero relational intelligence at this point. Right? Joseph, Joseph is what Brian Regan, the comedian, would call a me monster. You know what I'm talking about? Me monsters? This is, this is what, a me monster is an individual that, <clears throat> that when you tell a story, his response is, my story is better. You know me monsters? Like, like you could say to a me monster, well, I had to have my wisdom teeth cut out. I had, yesterday I had two wisdom teeth that were cut out. And me monster would go, I had four cut out. 
And they were impacted, both embedded in the bone, all four embedded in the bone. And they were upside down. The roots were coming out. I looked like a walrus with tusks coming out. And the dentist, the dentist couldn't even use any anesthesia. He just had to like, he just had to like punch me in the face and then drip tooth out. Like that was, that was the one, that was my story. My story's so much better than yours. Me, right? Me monster. Right? Come on. That's what Joseph is. He's a me monster. Every time he gets a little bit of something, he wants to go to his brothers and just unload. Look at how much glory I'm going to get. Look at how much power I'm going to have. Look at how much authority I'm going to have. Look at the dream that I've been given. Y'all know this about me monsters, right? They're hard to be around. They're hard to talk to. And Joseph's brothers hated him even more. This second dream, if the first one didn't go well, the second one didn't go well, because now mom and dad are bowing down too. And verse 10 says, when he told his father this, as well as his brother, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept this in mind. <clears throat> so, so far, here's what we know about Joseph. He was his daddy's favorite, which is not Joseph's fault. He had been given this, this amazing coat that showed everybody that I'm daddy's favorite. He had been a tattletale to his brothers. He had, he had thrown them under the bus for something they had done. And, and now he was having these dreams, these, these illusions of grandeur. And, and he wanted to go tell everybody about it. And no one could stand to be around Joseph. His brothers hated him. Look what happens next. Verse 12. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, You know your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I'm going to send them to you. Very well, he replied. So he said to them, Go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring word back to me. And he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. This is the Old Testament equivalent of making Joseph the hall monitor. I want you to go down and check on your brothers and tell me what it is they're doing that's bad. Tell me, is everything going okay? You're, you've already given me one bad report. I want you to go find some more dirt on them. I want you to go see what's going on. He replied, oh, excuse me, let's, let's keep going. A man found Joseph, this is verse 15, wandering around in the fields. And he asked him, who are you looking for? Verse 16, he replied, I am looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they're grazing their flocks? He, they have moved from here, the man said. I heard him say, let's go to Dothan. Free, free stuff right here. It's not part of the sermon. I want you to go home. I want you to think about something. Who is this man? I just want to wrap your head around this. He goes to Shechem to find his brothers, and there's some dude in the field finding him wandering. And that man directs him to where is he supposed to go. Why does Moses take up Bible space with that, telling us that? Hmm. Think about that. Okay, anyway. So Joseph went, and he found his brothers, and he found them near Dothan. Verse 18. But they saw him from a distance. And before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say what a ferocious animal devoured him. And then we'll see what comes of his dreams. Now, I want you to understand something here. I, I, I've seen sibling rivalry, okay? Okay. I know that there's some of you all that do this kind of competition thing and this battle with your siblings. I understand sometimes brothers and sisters and sisters and sisters and brothers and brothers don't get along very well. I get that. I had an uncle one time <clears throat> who was the eldest in his family, my Uncle Charles. I still have an uncle. Uh, uh, my, an uncle and, and he had a little sister. Her name was Shannon. And when she was born, he went to his mama and daddy and he offered them a proposal. He said, um, I don't like her. She stinks. Is it his? I'm not making this up. I would, I would propose that we go and we trade her in for a goat. Because a goat won't smell as bad as she does. That was his words, right? Okay. Now, they, of course, didn't go for that. So, so Charles, my uncle, he thought, I'm going to have to take matters into my own hands. And she, like to Shannon, used to like, like to play in the toilet. She would get in there, it's water. I don't know if she could climb in it. I don't know why. She used to get in the toilet and splash the water around. And so Charles had an idea. 
he was going to wait until she was in the toilet, and he did. She got in the toilet, and he ran in, and he flushed the toilet and ran out of the bathroom real quick, and her foot got stuck in the toilet. That plan didn't work either. I understand sibling rivalry. Here's the thing. No matter how much you are against your sister, no matter how much you are against your brother, you probably, 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 I dare say, never have had the thought, I just think what we need to do is kill them. Have you? Come on. You may have, you may have said in your mind, I will kill you. She didn't mean it. Right? Come on. You've never actually plotted and said, all right, so here's where this implement for disaster is, and here's where this implement for disaster is, and we can do it this way or that way. No, 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 no. You don't have those thoughts. Why? Because we're decent human beings. But here his brothers are, right? And they see him coming. You know why they can see him coming? It's because he's got that stupid coat on. There's no mistaking that it's Joseph walking down the hill to us. And I can only imagine, the Bible doesn't tell us about all the conversation, but I can only imagine the conversation that's had. Great. Great. He's going to come and see us. We may, may or may not be doing what we're supposed to be doing. I don't know. And he's going to come and he's going to go tattle on us again. That rat. Gosh, I can't stand Joseph. And the, the, the talk kind of goes around and finally one of them says something that everybody else has been thinking. You know what we need to do? We just need to take him. Not beat him up. Not rough him up a little bit. We need him out of our lives. Then, then, when we kill him, watch, when we kill him, we'll kill his dreams. We'll kill him. Look what happens next. Verse 21. When Reuben, this is the oldest brother, when Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the wilderness and don't lay a hand on him. And Reuben said this to rescue him and uh, rescue him from them and take him back to his father. Now let me tell you what's going on with Reuben. Because it sounds like Reuben's a pretty good guy. Maybe you've even heard preachers go, Man, Reuben, we should all be more like Reuben. Reuben's the only decent one in the bunch. Not so fast, my friend. See, just a couple chapters earlier, let me tell you what had happened with Reuben. And if you have young ones, then earmuffs. Here's what happened with Reuben. Reuben had been intimate doing adult things with his uh, daddy's wife. Ooh. See, you should read your Bible. It's better than any soap opera. All right? So Reuben had done adult things with his daddy's wife, and his daddy found out about it, and it was all about inheritance kind of stuff, and that wasn't good. And so Reuben was on the outs with his dad. And I think, and a lot of commentators think, that what Reuben is trying to do is get back in good with dad. Do you know why? Because as the eldest, he was going to get twice as much as everybody else. But if I'm on the outs with dad, that may not be the case. And so here's a way for me to take his favorite back to him, and all of a sudden, whoo, I'll be right back restored where I was because I sure did mess it up two chapters earlier. You with me? Look what happens. Verse 23. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing. And, and, and they took him and threw him into the cistern, and the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to have their meal... I want you to pause. I want you to understand the depravity that's in their hearts right here. First of all, first of all, walk with me through this. Joseph sees his brother. I wonder if he was thinking, hey guys, I don't know. And he gets close enough and one of them grabs him. <laughs> what are you doing, guys? Right? They rip his robe off of him. Yeah, I know. You don't really like the robe. Dad's favorite and all. And, oh, hey, wait. There's a big hole in the ground. You're going to, what? Hey guys, what? And they throw their brother with the intent of killing him into an empty well. And they sit down and eat lunch. Can you wrap your heads around that? Here's their brother, their flesh and blood. I wonder if, I wonder if Joseph could hear them talking. I wonder if he could hear them plotting. <laughs> I wonder if he cried out to his brothers, Hey guys, let me out of here. Hey guys, what are you doing? They're like, we should kill him. He's like, don't kill me. I don't know. What? But they're so callous. They're so hard. They're so depraved. They're actually eating a meal with their brother in a well right beside them. Look what happens. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Where they were was on a trade route going all the way down with Palestine, down into Egypt. 
um, their camels were loaded with spices and balm and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. And Judah, who says to his brothers, Judah, who out of Judah's line will come Jesus, by the way, just so you know, Judah says to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come now, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. So, so here's what happens. See, Judah, I don't think, is a good guy either. Judah is not interested in saving Joseph's life. Judah is just wondering. He's the, he's the businessman of the group. Hey, look, 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 look. I mean, come on. If we kill him, we don't get anything out of it. But if we sell him, we can make a little bit of money. If we sell him, we'll get a little bit of gain. If we sell him, then he'll probably end up dying anyway, but we won't be responsible for it. Somebody else will be responsible for it. He, after all, Judah says, he is our own flesh and blood. As he takes another bite of his peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And his brothers, all of them go, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, we should do that. Amazing. Verse 28, so when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. 20 shekels of silver, about two years' wages for the average shepherd. And the cost of a teenage male slave in this day and time. To take their brother out of a cistern, out of a well, and they negotiate a price for their brother. And then they load him up on a camel and they watch him walk away into the distance. Now here's... I, 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 want, I want us to try to empathize for just a minute. Just, just try to put ourselves in Joseph's shoes for just a second. And here's a guy that had, had dreams. Dreams that, that were from God even. Here's a guy that, that thought that, that God is going to make something out of me. God is going to raise me up. God is going to put me in positions of authority and power, so much so that my, even my family is going to be subject to me. Those, those were his dreams. That's what he thought his life would hold. And one day, while doing a favor for his dad, he sees his brothers from a long way off. I don't know if he was happy or sad or angry, or, but, but he sees them, and no doubt there's an emotion that's there. These are his brothers. He's been looking for them for days. And as he gets close enough, one of them grabs him. His robe comes off. I'm sure there was some, some roughing up that went on as they tossed him into this cistern. And from the bottom of a cistern, Joseph heard his brothers, no doubt, talking about what they were going to do. We should kill him. No, we shouldn't kill him. Yeah, we should kill him. No, you know what we should do? We should sell him. Well, how much should we ask for him? Well, I think the common price for a teenage boy slave is about 20 shekels. We should at least get that. I mean, he's 17 years old. He'd be good, a good slave. What we'll do is we'll just take this coat back to Dad and, and, and he'll assume something bad happened to him, right? And that animals have, have torn him up and, and the dreamer will be gone and his dreams will die with him. Can you imagine how Joseph felt as he stood there with his brothers, probably hands tied, with a group of foreigners out in front of him, hearing them talk about what he was worth. Not a human being, but an object. <laughs> a tool, an implement. <laughs> That's what they were negotiating. Can you imagine? I wonder if Joseph said anything. Oh no, guys, look, don't do this. You don't have to do this. I'll, you can have my coat. I'll help Dad make other coats. Like you can, have, you can all have coats. I don't know what, what he was saying, but no doubt he was probably trying to to, to, to speak some truth and help me. You know, hey, don't do this. Don't do this, guys. Can you imagine what he might have felt as he was on the camel's back watching his brothers get smaller and smaller and smaller as they walked away in the horizon? Do you think, do you think he was angry? Do you think he was hurt? Do you think he was sad? Do you think he... He felt abandoned. What do you think he thought about his dreams? That'll never happen now. Stupid dreams. Why? They got me in so much trouble. It's clear that wasn't from God. It's clear that's not what I was supposed to do. Because now, I don't know where I'm going. And I don't know who I'm going to be with. 
Do you think Joseph laid some blame? Do you think he tried to, tried to start running through his list of who was at fault for this? Do you think he was like, my dad, it's his fault. If he hadn't chosen me as his favorite and given me that coat, my, my God even gave me these dreams. Maybe it's God's fault that I'm here. You know what, though? Ultimately, Joseph maybe goes, I'm to blame because I'm the one that had zero relational intelligence. Could have benefited from a Dale Carnegie book or something. Like, I had zero relational intelligence. I didn't even begin to know what to do, how to communicate with people, and it got me in this mess. It got me in trouble. And ultimately, it's my brothers. their fault. See, here, here's the truth about Joseph's story up to this point. There's plenty of blame to go around, isn't there? There's plenty of people that we can point the finger at. The problem is, is that's not going to do Joseph any good in his current situation. But I just wanted to ask the question today. If Joseph had an opportunity from, from his cell or wherever it was they kept him that first night when they arrived at the campfire and, and the people of Midianites are sitting around and they're, they're eating whatever it is they're eating and he's tied up to one of them or tied up to a camel or tied up to something so that he can't get away because he's a slave that's worth a lot of money. If he were to be able to write a letter to his brothers, what do you think he'd say? Dear brothers, what do you think he'd say? Here's where this is going to get home for us. You see, I know that you have dreams. I know that you have visions about what it's supposed to be like. And just like we talked about a minute ago, so many of us have found ourselves in situations where, where our dreams are not coming to fruition, where it's not happening the way that we thought it would happen. God, I didn't think I would be this much in debt. God, I didn't think that I'd have two failed businesses. God, I didn't think that I'd have a failed marriage. God, I didn't think that I wouldn't have children. God, I didn't think that I wouldn't have finished school. God, I didn't think that I would have been, or this would have happened, or this would have happened. And your dreams, whatever they are, they haven't come to fruition. And here's, here's where you go with that. The natural inclination for you and for me is to you know, assign blame. Well, it's my daddy's fault because he didn't love me the way he was supposed to love me. It's my mama's fault because... She didn't do what she was supposed to do. It's, it's my boss's fault. He's such a lousy leader. It's the economy's fault that my business failed. Come on. It's my spouse's fault. It's my children's fault. And here's the thing. that I, I don't know your story, but here's what I know. Y'all, there's plenty of blame to go around. And it may even be true. It could be decisions you made. It could be decisions that, that were made for you. But, but, but to be honest with you, here's the thing. That doesn't matter right now. And if you were to find somebody that were to take ownership of your broken dreams, do you know what? It wouldn't change where you are right now. So the question is not who's to blame. The question is, how do I go from here? How do I deal with the diagnosis? How do I deal with the broken relationship? How do I deal with a bank account that's not where it's supposed to be? How do I deal with the emptiness that's inside because that loved one is gone? How do I move forward right now? What is it that I need to do to put one front in front of the other? Here's what I want you to know today. We'll flesh this out a little bit more in the weeks to come. Here's what I want you to know. Just because things didn't turn out the way you thought they would or should. That doesn't mean that God's not at work. Here's what I want you to know. This is big. This is big. Just because things didn't turn out the way that you thought they should or would, doesn't mean that God's not at work. I'm not asking you to believe me. I'm asking you to stick with me through the rest of the story. I'm asking you to come back and let's keep reading and let's keep looking. But today, here's what I want you to do. Today, I, I, I want you to, to start doing a couple things. Today, I want you to start thinking. And this may be difficult. I want you to start thinking about all the people that you blame. Maybe you need to write them down. Maybe you know exactly. Maybe it's one person. Maybe it's three people. <laughs> Maybe it's God. I want you to start thinking about the people that you're blaming for where you are right now. Maybe it's you. I want you to begin praying this prayer that God would give you the strength as we go through this journey in the next few weeks. That God would give you the strength 
to recognize His work even when we don't see it. As we work through this, it's going to be hard. So let's begin praying for strength as we move. Forward. Let me pray. God, thank you so much for the story of Joseph. God, we are just one chapter in. And God, it's so hard to see you at work when things don't turn out the way that we think they should be. And so God, right now, I pray that you would help us to just recognize those, those places where we start laying blame. Help, help us recognize those places where we point towards other people for our position. To those areas where we blame ourselves, those areas where we blame God, those areas where we blame our past or, or, or things that were beyond our control. God, I just pray that you would help us to bring those to mind so that we can, we can recognize them and understand them. Because once we recognize our tendency to lay blame, then we can start to move forward in this process. The same process that you took Joseph. God, we are here today and so many of us, so many of us are reeling in brokenness. Dreams that didn't turn out. Opportunities that didn't flesh out. Relationships that didn't end the way we wanted them to end. God, that's where we are today. Some of us have pushed away from you. Some of us have pushed away from church. Some of us have pushed away from family. We've isolated ourselves. Maybe we've, we've become addicted to something because of it. Open our eyes. And give us the strength that we need to go through this journey together. God, we love you. And we trust you. We respond today to you and your presence with us. Help us to realize that just because things haven't turned out the way we thought they should or could, that doesn't mean that you're not We love you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand as Matt and the team sings and leads us.